Hey there, good people. It's your Cripple Critic, and this week I want to talk about the Resident Evil 3 Remake. Resident Evil 3 Remake is more of a reimagining of the game Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, a game that was released 20 years ago on the PlayStation 1. Resident Evil 3 Remake is published by Capcom, just like all the other Resident Evil games. So if you've been following my channel for a while, you know I love horror games. And Resident Evil is probably my second favorite horror franchise. I played the second game remake and I really enjoyed it. So I was looking forward to see what they were going to do with a remake of the third game. I have mixed feelings about this game. But I still wanted to give it a proper accessibility review. So I'm going to start with just the controls and accessibility options. And then go into all the things I liked and didn't like about the gameplay, story, and characters. Alright, the controls. As far as Resident Evil 3 Remake goes, the controls are a lot like the Resident Evil 2 Remake, but I did want to mention that this time around, I played the PC version of this game instead of the PlayStation 4 version like I did for Resident Evil 2 Remake. The reason for that is if the third game was going to be anything like Resident Evil 3 Re Nemesis, then I knew it was going to be a lot more action oriented than the second game. So I wanted to maybe go for a PC version because PC games tend to have more options for you to change. And also, even though I did beat the second remake, it was a struggle. And I knew that if it was going to have more action, I might need some extra help or more customization that I can control. I'm probably going to repeat a lot of the same things I said about the Resident Evil 2 remake when it comes to controls at least. So if you want to look back at that video, you can. There are going to be some changes and I'll be talking about that in a little bit. But a lot of the controls and accessibility options are the same as they were in Resident Evil 2 remake. In fact, you'll notice most things stay the same even when it comes to assets and gameplay. But that's another topic. Every button can be customized, at least on the PC version, and this includes the mouse buttons as well. If you don't want to shoot with the keyboard key, you can make it a mouse button, or vice versa. You can't make a button have more than one function, and if you try, the game will stop you. There's also an aim assist, and yay! Aim assist is essential for disabled gamers with fine motor skill impairments, and for me personally, I wouldn't be able to play these games without it. Just like the original, Resident Evil 3 Remake has a lot more action, so having this aim assist is great. Aim assist is turned on automatically if you're playing on the assistive mode. There's sort of an improvement from the second remake, Resident Evil 2 Remake. If you remember, I thought it was strange. They did have aim assist, but even when you turned it on, it wouldn't really be on. You'd have to die a few times, and then the game would have this prompt in the game over screen basically saying hey are you okay you need some help turn on aim assist and that's not inherently bad but it just felt kind of like they were punishing you or saying that you know oh you're not that great at games so if you need some help just do this which you know disabled gamers need aim assist it doesn't have anything to do with their skill level so it's good to see in this game there's nothing like that once you turn on aim assist it's on there's no game over screen you need to go through. You can choose between holding down the run button and for action prompts you can do the same or you can toggle them in the options menu. The weird thing is when you fight zombies in Resident Evil 3 Remake you're prompted to hold a button down and if you get grabbed it doesn't really matter you'll always get bitten even if you succeed and you press the button in time. My only guess is the prompt is there to stop you from getting excessive health loss, but either way, when you get grabbed, you you will always get bitten. Still, for other prompts like turning a crank or, you know, during a QTE event in a boss battle, it's a lot easier if you put it on holding button instead of tapping rapidly. I think people with fine motor skill impairments will know that this is a lot easier for them. By the way, I say there's QTEs, but they give you so much time between each prompt that it's really hard to miss and really hard to fail these moments. 
I guess as long as you can press the button they want you to press, you will probably be able to do it. It's pretty simple. There's very few timed moments in this game, unlike in the original, so I figured that's something to mention. So Resident Evil 3 Remake has three difficulty modes to choose from. Assisted mode, standard mode, and hardcore mode. Assisted mode is basically easy mode, and like I said before, when you play on assisted mode, aim assist is automatically turned on. Also, you have regenerating health, enemies are a lot weaker, ammo is everywhere, and you start the game with an assault rifle, which is pretty cool. I did want to mention that even with these options, I still had to use different apps and programs on the computer just to help me because this game does have a lot of action and fast movement. You may have seen in a previous video that I had to use a macro to help me aim and also you can see in the video right now that I'm using an on-screen keyboard. I do think that has more to do with my personal preference on how I want to play and my limitations, but playing the PC version of this game helps a lot. So just like Resident Evil 2 Remake and I think a few other titles in the franchise, the zombies in this game are somewhat unpredictable. When I say that, I mean that when you see a zombie and they go down, they don't always stay down. Uh, they can get up at random times and sometimes you'll see a body and you're not sure whether it's really dead or it's going to come back or pop up. So there's a bit of an unpredictability to the enemies. I bring that up because unpredictability for disabled gamers with fine motor skill impairments usually means having to react quickly or move quicker or think on your feet and that can be difficult if you have problems moving. But I want to clarify because even though I say they're unpredictable, it's more that they have the illusion of being unpredictable. What I mean by that is every enemy in the game is actually on like a programmed schedule. So even though one might be laying on the ground and pop up, it's always going to do it at the same time. It's never going to be like another one. So if you die and you go back to the same area, it'll pop up the exact same time. It wouldn't just stop or turn out it's another zombie that would do a pop up instead. Every enemy is on a schedule and if you're able to pay attention to that and sort of understand that schedule, it can be pretty easy to figure out. I know for some gamers it's not fun to think about the schedule of enemies because it could be kind of game breaking, especially in an atmospheric game or a horror game, but I like to think about that kind of thing when I'm playing just because it helps me figure out how much effort I should put into each scene, so I just wanted to put that out there. So this brings me to Nemesis, the big hulking creature that chases you throughout the game. In the original game, Nemesis was pretty dangerous. He would find you in random places, and if you didn't have the right weapon, or if you weren't quick enough, he could take you out really easy. But in the remake, he's still dangerous. I mean, he can still hurt you, but like I said with the other enemies, he's on a scheduled like program, so every time you see him, it's going to kind of be the same experience, and you can figure it out pretty easy. Also, with a good time grenade or rocket launcher blast, you can really subdue him pretty quick. So I'd say that the tactical challenge that was in the original for him is gone, but in a lot of ways it's more manageable now for disabled gamers to fight him. That's about it when it comes to accessibility for disabled gamers with fine motor skill impairments. There's a lot of good options. If I had one gripe, it would be that there's no camera orienting feature. Again, I brought this up with the Resident Evil 2 remake. It would free up the right control stick for a lot of people if you had this feature. You know, it would be something that would make it so the camera followed your movements. It's weird because they've had this feature in a lot of their games, not way back with the tank controls like 1, 2, and 3, but all the way back to Resident Evil 4, 5, 6, and even the Resident Evil Revelations had this feature, like the over-the-shoulder look, but also you wouldn't have to use the right control stick to move the camera, it would just follow your movements. 
Other big third-person action games have this feature. The Uncharted series, the new Tomb Raider games, even the new Final Fantasy VII Remake has it. I managed to do okay playing it without that feature, but it would be a lot easier for disabled gamers like me. I've been trying to reach out to Capcom and see if they can maybe add it later, but I will update you later on whether that ever happens. As far as options for gamers with visual impairments, the remake did a pretty good job. There's a brightness slider you can change, which is pretty helpful for dark parts of the game. I'd say that indoor sections like factories, the hospital, or houses are pretty bright, but the cityscape is pretty dark, so turning the brightness up may help a lot of people. If you don't like how close the camera is to the main character, you can pan the camera back in the options menu. I never really thought the screen got too cluttered, but if it is for you, you can turn off the HUD in the options menu, and you can also turn off tutorial pop-ups. You guys know how much I hate tutorials that pop up all the time, so that was nice. For colorblind players, there's an option to change the color of the aiming reticle. You can change it from white to green to blue and to red. I've been really impressed with Capcom when it comes to these kind of options. I've seen colorblind options in their games for at least 10 years now, and that's really cool. Actually, Resident Evil game was the first game that I ever saw colorblind options in this way, and that's really interesting, especially coming from a Japanese developer. For gamers with hearing impairments, you can customize the individual sound levels. This includes things like sound effects, dialogue, and music. You can also change the voiceover language, and there are easily readable subtitles available even during combat. So that concludes the accessibility section. It was pretty accessible. I think a lot of disabled gamers will have a good amount of options to help them. So now I want to get into what I did and didn't like about the story and characters. First I wanted to preface this by saying I tried to do a lot more research into this game. I even went back and played the original game again, Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. Resident Evil 3 Nemesis actually has a special place in my heart. I know that I have said that Resident Evil 2, the original Resident Evil 2, was my favorite in the series, and it is, but Resident Evil 3 was kind of special because I got that game back when I was like 15, and I got it from my old high school PE coach, <laughs> which, that's a funny story. As you know, I'm pretty severely disabled and in a wheelchair, so going to PE class was always kind of funny. I mean, I could definitely learn about health and fitness, but doing any of it was not really possible. But with my coach in high school, he did something really neat. He gave me video games to play. Yeah, I guess instead of physical reflexes, he would try to test my mental reflexes. Not at school, but I could take them home and play them. He was a really awesome guy, and I appreciate what he did. He gave me a bunch of different games to play, but Resident Evil 3 Nemesis was by far my favorite. So yeah, I'm going to be comparing a lot of the remake to the original in this section, mostly to do with the story and characters, but sometimes gameplay elements. But I wanted to say that I can admit, with any remake or reimagining, there's going to be big changes, and I might not like some of them, but it doesn't mean that they aren't necessary, and I understand that. I can also admit that there's a lot that the remake did better, especially when it comes to accessibility. After playing the original again, man, I didn't realize how tough it was. I mean, I remember it being tough, but they throw you into the action really quick and you are going to have a hard time. Even on easy mode, there's a reason people say this is the most action-heavy Resident Evil game, at least for the time. There's not really many customizable options in the controls. There, as far as visual options, there's only a brightness slider. And oh yeah, there's no subtitles in the original. So, I mean, deaf players were just out of luck, I guess. They wanted to understand the story in Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. But even so, there was aim assist. Yeah, can you guys believe it? The, in the original game, there was aim assist you could turn on. But that's what I mean. Capcom's done a lot of good with their games. I'm a big fan of Resident Evil. You guys know this. I bring that up because, like in my Mortal Kombat review, I, when I complain about things in this game, 
I'm doing it out of love because I love the series and I just know they can do better. But anyway, let's get into it. So the beginning of Resident Evil 3 Remake is rough. And I don't mean the gameplay, I mean the dialogue, the story, and the pacing is real bad. There's been a lot of talk already online about how much content they removed from the original game. And I'll get into that a little bit, but it is really obvious in the first 20 minutes of the game, things feel rushed. In the beginning, everything is moving so fast, you have no time to take anything in. Nothing really feels scary, and any of the characters that you encounter just feel pointless or just throw away. I guess this could be excusable if maybe they were doing it to ramp up the tension and keep you on the edge of your seat, but that is not the case. You never really feel like anything's going to hurt you that much. It doesn't help there's a lot of on-rail scene in the beginning, so you don't feel like you have a whole lot of control. This is where I could already tell that this game was trying to be way too many things all at once. You'll see what I mean in a minute, but there were just a lot of ideas that you could tell they wanted to work with, but then they just dropped suddenly. I don't know about a lot of fans, but I could tell from the first trailer that this game was going to take a lot of liberties when it came to taking from the original game, just with the dialogue, and it seemed like they were trying to make it like edgy and talk more about the corporation and the anti-government and all sorts of things, but in the end it really didn't do any of that. It just sort of wanted to say a lot and didn't say anything. Alright, wanted to warn you that I'm probably going to talk about some spoilers in the story, so if you don't want to hear any of that, definitely skip to the end, and I will give you that warning now. 3, 2, 1, done. Okay, so the game starts out with a really bizarre umbrella PSA with a live action twist to it. Yeah, live action. I don't really know why. All I could think is they're trying to maybe harken back to the very first Resident Evil, but yeah, it's odd. Even weirder is that there's this sort of like relevant global pandemic thing going on, or at least a disease that's spreading throughout the country. I know the game was supposed to be in development for at least a year, but this is just eerie the way they're comparing it to real life. What's worse is by doing that, they're kind of muddling up the already kind of messed up canon. I had to stop when they said that the whole country was being infected because I didn't remember any of the games saying the whole country of America was infected. I think it was only like pockets of different cities. But then later on in the game, they like change their mind and go back to it just being in Raccoon City. I guess this is one of those ideas they just dropped. Then we get to Jill in her apartment and for some reason it's first person. Yeah, I don't really want to go into all the reasons this is stupid and a wasted opportunity, but to me, it was kind of like, what is the point? It only lasted about a minute, and they didn't even use it to have any, like, jump scares or anything, so I don't know. And yeah, we never go back to first-person view. There was one kind of cool moment when Jill's looking in the mirror, and it's the scene in the trailer where she starts to turn and look like a zombie, but then it turns out she's just having a nightmare. I was really excited about the scene in the trailer because I thought it was going to hint at some, like, inner mental struggle she was going to have about feeling scared that she might get infected, but really this is the only time. I guess it could be foreshadowing when Jill actually gets infected by Nemesis near the end of the game, but she was never really scared. Like, she's not scared of anything in this game. In fact, the only emotions that Jill shows in this game is snark and anger, but I'll get to that later. But yeah, creepy zombie nightmare about getting infected that never gets addressed again. I, I don't know, I guess this is just another idea they dropped. So yeah, then Jill wakes up and her phone is ringing. If you answer it, that's when Nemesis busts in. But before you do that, you have the option of looking around the room and reading some of her journal entries and other paperwork. Now this part I will admit is me nitpicking a little, but if you read one of her journal entries, she starts talking about when she was in the first game, like back when she was investigating the mansion in Raccoon City. She starts talking about how she doesn't understand why she and the other survivors weren't infected, even though they've been bitten several times. And she has all these theories, like maybe she's immune and maybe other people are immune to the virus. It's just bizarre. 
You see, in most zombie games, I think we as the player are supposed to assume that if the main character doesn't die or get infected when they get bitten, it's really just because of main character armor and it's just more convenient so the player doesn't have to worry about dying or getting infected every time a zombie bites them. And most games just don't try and address it, but this game does, and when you do that, you kind of have to explain why they can't get infected. But of course, this doesn't matter anyway, because near the middle of the game, Jill does get infected, but only when Nemesis stabs her. How does that make sense? I don't know. I guess it's just one of those ideas that they tried to come up with and then just dropped. But yeah, now here comes Nemesis. So, I did want to say that I don't really have a whole lot of complaints about Nemesis. I've read online and I know a lot of players don't really like what they did with him in the remake. Mostly it had to do with how easy he is. I'll be honest guys, in the original and the remake, he's just more of a pain in the ass, not really like something I was enjoying anytime he showed up. Maybe it's because I'm disabled, but I actually appreciated the lower difficulty. Yeah, he definitely was a scary character and intimidating, but yeah, I just didn't care that much about how easy it was to fight him. I will admit that all of the on-rail section that had to do with him are kind of stupid. I mostly just didn't like them because they were repetitive. But yeah, Nemesis comes and forces us to come hurtling towards the plot, which is basically Escape Raccoon City Alive. Now we get to one of my bigger gripes in the game, and that is the dialogue. Yes, in between fights with Nemesis and exploring the city, you'll have to listen to really terrible dialogue. I know it might be hard to convince you that the dialogue is that bad when the series has always been really goofy and there's some amazing gems like this. That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. It's a weapon. It's really powerful, especially against living things. But I don't know. I kind of thought that some of their newer games were trying to go for a more scary, realistic tone. I mean, when Resident Evil 7 came out, that had a very consistent dark feel. And heck, I mean, Resident Evil 2 Remake, I thought, had a lot of surprisingly dark scenes. I remember feeling like the dialogue had been really improved from the original, and there were even scenes that I felt a policeman would actually say the lines they were giving him. But then I play Resident Evil 3 Remake and I get this. But right now it's got a hard on for the only two stars left in town. You and me. We can use this to stay in contact. I know what a radio is. There's still people in the city. You think Uncle Sam gives a shit? Give me the vaccine, you greedy son of a bitch. No, 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 no. You want to money. I like money. <laughs> it's just so stupid. I mean, no one would say this. No human would say any of these things. Half of these lines are just like someone's attempt at capturing the dialogue from a action movie blockbuster. You know, some of those one-liners, but doing it really bad. It just became painfully obvious to me really quick that this was going to be a big drop in quality when it came to the dialogue, even just comparing it to the last remake. It was so bad that I was convinced it was a different writer from the second remake. By the way, you guys, I tried to look up some of the writers for this game, and I can't find it anywhere online. IMDB says that there is one writer, it's Yasuhisa Kawamura, but he wrote the original script for the game back in 1999, and I'm 99% sure he is not the only writer for this game. It's hilarious to me. It's like the company knows it's bad, so they're trying to hide all the writers from everyone else. I did notice when I read IMDb that uh, the Resident Evil 2 remake had only two directors, while this game had five, so that could explain how muddled the writing is and why there's so many ideas dropped. There's so many? Jill, there's like five zombies. Didn't you fight like a million in the first game? <laughs> I don't know why this part was so funny to me. Also, if the game was trying to make me like Brad's character at all, maybe they shouldn't have had him stare directly at a herd of zombies and then act surprised when they jump over the fence. Doesn't matter anyway, he dies like five seconds later. Serves you right, Brad. So the next few moments go by really fast, 
and in my opinion, it's to the detriment of the game. Things are just speeding by, and there's no time to take in anything you see, no time for any emotional introspection. This all leads to the helicopter scene. So Jill hears on the radio that there's a helicopter that's going to land on top of this building, and it's going to lead her to safety. This scene is in the original, and man, in the remake, do they botch it bad. In the original, the helicopter scene happens about halfway through the game. So there's a real, like, feeling that you might be at the end of the game when you get to this point, because you've been going through so much. Jill gets to the top of the building, and she's really excited to be done with all this horrible stuff. And then Nemesis pops out of nowhere and shoots it down with a rocket launcher. In the remake, this scene happens about 10 to 15 minutes at the beginning of the game, and I don't have any idea why. They completely slipped the tension out of the scene, because why would anyone believe this is the end of the game? She's not going to get rescued. Even funnier is that you could tell the developers forgot that they wanted to wait to show Nemesis with actual weapons, so they just end up kind of awkwardly cutting to a rocket launcher hitting the helicopter, but not showing where it came from, but then Nemesis walks up anyway. It's real bad. No idea why they did this. So then Jill gets super mad, jumps in a car, crashes into Nemesis, and they both go flying off of a 10-story building. Somehow neither of them have a scratch on them, but oh no, Nemesis is about to kill her, and then Carlos comes out of nowhere and saves her from imminent death. So this is where I started to have some issues with their new characterization for Jill. Up until this point, Jill acts like any other Resident Evil main character, just kind of beige, zombie-killing badass, but a blank slate for the player to just put themselves in their place. But then she has this exchange with a dude that just saves her life. Our guys have converted some subway cars into a shelter. It's safe. I'm fine. Personal space. Okay, I get it. Oh, snap, guys. Look out. It's a feminist character. She's a strong, independent woman who don't need no man. The scene made me laugh out loud because it was just so weirdly hostile for no reason. Like, at first I tried to think it was maybe because she was shook up from almost dying and didn't know this dude, but no, she kind of had a sour attitude towards him and most other guys for most of the game. I actually prefer to play this scene like this because it makes a little more sense as to why it would play out this way, like, whoa, dude, hold up, lay off the goods. <laughs> then Jill finds out that Carlos is working for Umbrella, and that gets her even more mad with him. And to her credit, Umbrella sucks, they did cause all of this, but it doesn't seem like Carlos knew that or most of the team either. Instead of keeping that information to herself and seeing how everything was going to play out, maybe seeing what information she can get from the team, she just kind of blows up at Carlos. We can use this to stay in contact. I know what a radio is. In the original, Jill is initially distrustful of Carlos, but very quickly realizes that most of the crew don't understand exactly what Umbrella is doing, and she realistically gets that it's a zombie apocalypse and we need to work together if we're going to survive. I also remember in the original, when she first meets Carlos, she actually saves him from dying. Uh, you know, and it kind of cements her as being really useful to the group. I don't know why they flipped the roles in the remake. I kind of felt like in the original, they saved each other a bunch of times equally. I thought of them as equal characters. In the remake, Jill gets saved by Carlos a bunch of times. She does save him once near the end, but the ratio is really off. I didn't really understand why they did that. So then Jill meets the rest of Carlos' crew, and basically they just hate each other on sight, they don't trust each other, but for some reason they need each other? I don't know. But really, most of the guys that Jill encounters throughout the game, they're either an asshole, or sexist, or a little of both. Really, most people are out for themselves in this game. I'm not saying that the original was just sunshine and rainbows, but it was just a little more nuanced to some of these characters. like. Mihail, he was, you know, a little rough around the edges, but in the end he just wanted to help with friends. There's actually a pretty cool scene in the original where Mihail is kind of hurt and he's waiting in the subway. If you go up to him as Jill, she'll try and comfort him and let him know it's going to be okay. The original Jill was really caring and selfless. She was always worried about other people's emotional well-being. Sorry. I feel so useless. Don't. You fought hard and have the wounds to prove it. 
I know, I know, women don't have to be caring and nurturers, but that wasn't her only character trait. She was still badass. She could take down demon dogs with a grenade launcher. It's just one aspect of who she was. In the remake, Jill is just cynical all the time, and even smug. There's this one scene that kind of irked me. It has to do with the quest where you're having to help the crew get the subway started again because they apparently found like 10 survivors and they want to get the subway started so they can get them to safety. For some reason Jill's the only one that can get it started but one of the crew members makes like a joke about how they don't think she's strong enough to do it I guess because she's a girl and then this happens. Maybe show you a tall drink of water like yourself and put out a few flames. Fuck you. Damn, Jill, I didn't think it was that serious. I don't even think the writers understood that they kind of made Jill look like she was a little petty. I don't know, it's like it rubbed me the wrong way, like Jill somehow cares more about one-upping this dude than saving survivors in the zombie apocalypse. I mean, the whole conversation itself felt really unnatural and awkward, no one would ever say these things. I just think, like, why the sexism all the time? I call this baby's first feminist character. Oh, uh, okay, let's make Jill really cold and angry and hostile towards men. Real original, guys. Now I will admit there was a little bit of sexism in the original, but it mostly revolved around Nikolai. When he first meets Jill, he does kind of talk to her like she's a small, weak child, but then he realizes she's in the STARS group, which is a early military group, but... I mean, Nikolai is the villain. He kills his own teammates in cold blood. Not exactly someone we're supposed to relate to. Can't we focus on getting out of here alive, saving each other, saving other people? Speaking of saving people, in the remake, helping survivors is almost a non-existent thing. And it's really strange because I think it would have helped alleviate some of the other problems in the story. In the original, there's some really cool scenes. It's kind of a small thing, but... I remember I'd be running through the city and, you know, be really quiet and feel isolated and all of a sudden you'd hear a scream or something and you'd see a survivor run towards the door, try to get to them and then they're already dead. Or you'd hear a scream and then you'd try to chase after them and it turns out they're being eaten by zombies. It was really unsettling and kind of sad, like you were just right out of reach of maybe saving someone if you just tried harder. And it did feel like the game was encouraging you to feel like that, like you could save them if you just tried. But that never really happened at all in the remake. There are those survivors, like I said, on the subway, but you only see them for half a second. You can't interact with any of them, and they die off screen. Jill definitely doesn't care when they die either. Real quick, I wanted to go back to a scene right before the helicopter scene in the remake. Remember, Jill's trying to get to the top of this building so she can get to the helicopter, but before that, she runs into a guy named Dario Rosso, who I guess is like a salesman who lives in town. He's one of the only survivors you can interact with, or really just encounter in the game. She just kind of stumbles upon him, he's really grumpy and mean to her, she tries to get him to come with her, and he's like, no, and then hides in a container and tells her to leave him alone. That's it, nothing else. He doesn't come back to find him again. He doesn't ever come up again. It was just that scene. I don't even know what like players who hadn't played the original would think of Dario. Like, well that guy was weird and annoying. I don't really care about him. Probably how they feel about most of the characters in the remake. In the original, Dario is just one of the survivors you can encounter, but he is pretty big. Like, when she talks to him, you can tell that his wife and daughter had just been killed and eaten by zombies. I thought they were implying that Jill had saved him just in time. I mean, he's still grumpy and kind of a jerk, but at least we know why. I mean, he just saw his family get killed. Also, in the original, when he hides in the container, there's this really creepy moment where if you try and talk to him, he'll tell Jill to leave him alone, but he says it in this really creepy, deep voice that I thought implied that he might have been bitten by a zombie and he was going to turn any time. You can even go back to the warehouse in the original and you can find his possibly zombified body running around. Also, he writes a journal entry that tells you a little more about him. He's really scared in the journal entry. He talks about how he wishes he could have been a writer instead of doing what his mom told him to. Like, you know, make him sort of a character. 
all of this is completely taken out of the remake. You, you can't go back to see him, and there's no journal entry or anything. No mention of a daughter or his family. He's just some jerk that you encounter, and then you never see him again. Yeah, I don't get it. I guess they just wanted to make him completely unsympathetic like every other character that Jill encounters. But the crowning moment of awful, like the awkward, just worst bit of dialogue, is near the end of the game. It's right after Jill gets infected and she's been cured. Carlos goes and gets a cure for her and cures her and she's waking up. By the way, I thought they missed a really good opportunity to use a line from the original. When Jill is infected in the original, she tells Carlos, you know, don't hesitate to kill me if I turn. I don't want to be one of those monsters. And it's crazy because in the remake, they already have that scene set up with Jill having the nightmare about being infected. So you'd think they'd have this, like, badass moment where she tells him, like, shoot me, I don't care. But that never happens. She just kind of lays there comatose. Anyway, in the remake, she just wakes up and Carlos isn't even there. She asks one of his teammates, hey, what happened? Who saved me? And then this happens. They're gonna blow the city sky high. I'm trying to get a hold of someone, anyone with the clearance to stop it. Leave this mess to him. He's a professional. So am I. <laughs> what? No, no, no. That wasn't a line. That, that can't be a line. How can a game back in 1999 have more subtlety when it came to sexism than a game that came out now? It's insane. And why did there need to be so many scenes with sexism? Like, it's a zombie apocalypse. I don't get it. I mean, why even change Jill's characterization so drastically? I asked my friend about it, and he thought that maybe they did it because they were hoping that this game would be a game that if a player had never played any Resident Evil, they could somehow understand that Jill was a badass, but the only way they knew how to do that is to make her just a super uber feminist who just constantly dealt with sexism? I don't know. You know, I looked online and I didn't really hear a lot of people talking about the issue I had with Jill. Most people who say they have an issue with Jill in the remake are just annoyed that you can't dress her up in a skimpy outfit like in the original, but just like me in Mortal Kombat 11, that's not really my issue. Don't get me wrong, I love titillation just like the next guy, but you know, I if you know me, you know that I don't care what a video game character is wearing. They could be wearing nothing, they could be wearing skimpy clothing, that's cool. They could be wearing, you know, head-to-toe clothes, that's cool. What I care about is personality and their actions. Are they badass? Are they relatable? Are they likable? And Jill in the remake is not very likable. But to clear things up, it's not just like, oh, females with attitude. I love chicks with attitude. In fact, my favorite video game character of all time is Heather Mason from Silent Hill 3. And oh boy, that's the queen of attitude. But like, that's not her whole character. There's just one aspect. I mean, she had a lot of baggage too. Like, give me that. Give me baggage or reason for this person acting this way. Something. So, by the end of the game, Jill does kind of soften up to Carlos. But there's never, like, an aha moment, you know, where she realizes, you know, he was, she was wrong about the way she judged him and he actually had good intentions. No, that never happens. She never admits she was wrong. She never says that he, you know, meant well. He apologizes to her, you know, oh, you were right about Umbrella, and I was wrong, and that's it. <laughs> no one really learns anything. There wasn't a story about hubris with Jill. It just kind of ends like that. Like, okay, uh, I don't know. What a weird message. But, yeah, I mean, I think, like I said, it was, the whole game was trying to be way too much. One part action movie, one part survival horror. One part reimagining slash remake of the third game. One part, like, game that catch other gamers up to speed who've never played a Resident Evil game. Just too much. Dialogue was too goofy. The pacing was too fast. And there was just no emotional weight to anything. Yeah. Well, except for one scene. And I'll get to that in a second. Yeah, I know I spent like 20 minutes talking about all the stuff I didn't like. But there were some things I did like, and I actually had a lot of fun playing this game, despite all that. So, one thing I liked was Carlos. <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm gay, and he's really hot. He's cool, he's likable, God. He cares about other people, he admits when he's wrong. 
I also kind of like that he looks more ethnic in the remake. Because in the original, you could, like, barely tell. Just, his name is Carlos, and he had the hilarious accent. But, yeah, Carlos was cool. I liked him. When the game isn't throwing crazy explosions and bad one-liners at me, and it actually slows down, there are some really creepy moments. Walking through the city in dark alleys really got my anxiety up. And there were a few moments that reminded me why I liked the original so much. Just like in the second remake, the zombies are more threatening, and I really like that there are bodies laying around, and you really don't know whether they're going to jump up, and that gave some nice tension and unpredictability. Even though I know I said they are on a time schedule, there's still kind of the illusion of unpredictability, and I like that. But by far my favorite scene, and probably the best scene in the whole game, was at the police station where Marvin Branagh gets bit by Brad. Oh man, does this seem creepy. So Marvin is this police officer from the second game, and in this we actually get to see when he got bit, and it's by a Stars member, no less. Brad's a straight up zombie, and he's going towards Marvin. Marvin's like, oh, I can't do it, I'm sorry, man, I gotta shoot you. And then Brad, in his zombie form, goes, sorry. Oh snap, and everybody's shocked, including Marvin, and that's how he gets bit. This scene is so creepy and weird and kind of sad. I'm like, what? Zombies can talk? Is it just like residual memories? Is he learning how to mimic humans in order to get them to a false sense of security? Like, what is this? It's crazy. I know that you can technically put this in the category of a dropped idea because they never bring this up again. Talking zombies? Nope. But I don't know, I actually kind of thought it worked better that they didn't talk about what happened or, you know, talk about what it could mean. Just leave it unknown. That it really worked. It's also, hands down, the only scene with emotional weight in the entire game. And it lasts less than like two minutes. I think you just feel the despair and desperation and surprise. You just, it works, you know, job well done. It's a good scene, good scene. It's funny, Marvin in the second remake was also really cool, and I liked a lot of his scenes in that game. Maybe it's the actor. This guy, he's, he's pretty cool. I'm going to have to look up this voice actor. He he gets it. But yeah, guys, those are some things I liked. Like I said, the accessibility was great. Capcom's always on point with accessibility. I just really thought they could do better with the characters and the story. But anyway, one last thing. If you guys were wondering, the footage that I used, you probably saw some, like, different mods. Well, I'm actually using a mod from, or I'm using several mods from this guy who goes by the name Tough Recoil. He's great. He's really talented. I loved playing with some of these mods. He doesn't just do, like, nude mods, even though those are awesome um, and funny. There's also, like, crazy hairstyles, and you can even switch out characters from... Different video games like The Last of Us, you can switch them out for Ellie, you can do Devil May Cry, you can have characters from Mega Man, all sorts of stuff. So check his stuff out, I'll, I'll put a link to his Patreon at the bottom, and uh, yeah, I, I can definitely say that his mods made the game like way more fun to play. So yeah, there you go, check him out. Alright guys, thank you so much for letting me rant about this. I had so many thoughts I wanted to get out of my head about the Jill stuff. And yeah, let me know what you guys think. Did you like Jill's character? What did you think of the game? Um, let me know in the comment section down below. Well, from now on, you'll be getting other content. Not just me ranting about Resident Evil 3. But uh, look forward to new stuff soon. I really appreciate all you guys, and thank you for listening, and as always, I will see you later.